the failure of the Federal Reserve to uh, adhere to the mandate has created these problems, which are not only our problems, but the problems for the rest of the world. The Federal Reserve's culpability here cannot be ignored. There's no better person to speak with about the impact of the Federal Reserve's actions than our next guest. I'm talking about Dr. Lacey Hunt. He is the Executive Vice President of Hoisington Asset Management. Prior to that, he was the Chief Economist at HSBC, and he was a uh, Senior Economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. He's been a presenter at our Strategic Investment Conference for over a decade. Uh, I hold him in the highest regard. He's a longtime friend of ours at Malden Economics. I hope you enjoy what I am sure is going to be a fascinating interview with Dr. Lacey Hunt. Lacey Hunt, it's so good to see you again. Uh, you've been such a great friend to us at Malden Economics. Thank you for joining me for our Global My Macro. My pleasure, Ed. Great to be with you. So we're going to get right into the meat of things with you. And for our viewers who, who know you well, you know they know how technical you can get. But before we go there, Lacey, I really want to make sure we bring as many people as we can with us in this discussion because it's so important right now. Can you start by just giving a brief explanation of when, when people hear that the Federal Reserve is hiking interest rates, what are they actually hiking and how does that interest rate affect the rest of, of interest rates in the economy? Well, they're talking about the overnight policy rate, the one-day rate. And of course, um, the only one that uh, operates at that, that rate are the, the, the Federal Reserve and uh, the depository institutions and the foreign official institutions and, and a few other folks. And so they're hoping by changing the one day rate uh, that they can influence the intermediate and longer term rates, especially those that are more critical to uh, borrowing in the private sector. Um, when, they, when they raise or lower the policy rate, um, the Federal Reserve uh, has to uh, increase or reduce uh, the level of total reserves outstanding or the monetary base, one of those two aggregates. And um, the, the change in the monetary base or total reserves uh, has an important influence upon the money supply or other deposits, which I think is actually the more critical variable. And while they focus only on the policy rate, uh, it is probably of far greater significance what happens to the growth in um, other deposits and total liquidity. So would it be fair to say that the Fed funds rate, uh, which the Fed influences or sets, is the lowest interest rate that you'd find anywhere in the economy, and that everything else is, is, is sort of tied to that. It's not, it's, it, it's tied very indirectly. And uh, to, as the rates go to longer maturity, the influence weakens very dramatically. Uh, and um, the policy rate can, can stay very low for a long period of time. And it may stay low because the Federal Reserve is accelerating the rate of growth in total reserves. This is what happened in, in 2020 and 2021, in which uh, other deposit liabilities of the banks, which is their main source of funding for bank credit, uh, increased at an uh, almost unprecedented rate of 20% for two years. And so uh, looking at the policy rate by itself is really not that important. Um, also, when the Fed raises the short-term rate, um, taken in conjunction with other variables, the shape of the yield curve may shift. Sure. And the shape of the yield curve is uh, actually far more important variable than the policy rate. Right now, for example, uh, the yield curve is inverting. In fact, very dramatically so between, uh, say, the two-year note and the 10-year note. In, in fact, we're uh, the most inverted now since... Uh, 2000, and um, we're almost at the same point of maximum inverge, uh, inversion of the curve that occurred prior to the 2000 recession, just a few basis points away. And, and so 
uh, the policy rate itself gets the tension from the press, but um, for the monetary economist, the macroeconomist, uh, that, that really provides a very minimal understanding of where monetary policy is taking the economy. That's interesting. Well, why do you think that is? Because I, if you tune into CNBC or Bloomberg every morning, I mean, you, you're not going to have an hour go by without some discussion about what is the Fed going to do with rates. And, and this year has been a really interesting year. I mean, first rate hike since 2018, back in, in March, and then not just one, but two of the largest hikes uh, that the Fed has ever enacted since, since 1994, uh, back to back this year. So certainly rates are, are, are a big news item this year. They are a news item, but um, let's let, to my way of thinking, um, the more significant issue is that the Fed created this huge, massive pile of liquidity in 2020 and 21. They are now shrinking that pile of liquidity over the first eight months of this year. However, looking at the growth in liquidity from the end of 2019, in other words, before the pandemic, um, it's still growing at a annual rate of about 14 to 15%. Uh, and then the Fed, quite frankly, got behind the eight ball. Um, they say they're data dependent but when the inflation rate moved above 2% to 3% to 4 and now the core inflation rate is uh, 6% or in three times their target, the Fed was very slow to react. Uh, and they've allowed a, um, uh, what we call a money price wage spiral. Money accelerates first, then prices. Now we're seeing some acceleration in wages. Now, so the Federal Reserve has to be able to not only reverse the price increases that got that moved far beyond their target, but we've got a, a potential upturn in wages, which complicates the Fed's ability to restore uh, price stability. So the Fed has made large moves in the federal funds rate, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are close to creating the, the necessary conditions to restore uh, the Fed's target. They're far away from that. The inflation rate is peaked, but it's still extremely high relative to where it needs to be. And in the meantime, uh, the country is suffering from the worst cost of living crisis in 42 years. It's been having a devastating impact on the well being of about 180 million of our households. And, and so they've they have um, created a situation that's largely of their making, although it's important to recognize um, that this was a joint monetary and fiscal policy operation. It created this excessive growth. Um, the Federal Reserve is, it was not supposed to become uh, an adjunct part of fiscal policy. It was supposed to be independent. That's the way the Federal Reserve was set up. And uh, in 2020 and 21, the Federal Reserve um, gave up that independence. They did this in the early 70s, 1971, 72. And the results, the results then were just as bad as they are today. So um, uh, knowing that the Fed is going to hike or amount that they hike the short-term rate tells very little about the overall monetary situation. So you said that they're they're behind on not just interest rates, but on their balance sheet, essentially. Um, they, I would let me phrase it this way: of this huge mountain of liquidity that they created in 2021, which is, which is the main source of the inflation. There were supply side disruptions, but they persisted in allowing the liquidity to increase rapidly in the face of the supply side disruptions. And, and so this mountain of liquidity is now being reduced, but at a very small pace. And there is still an excessive amount of liquidity. 
uh, that is there to fuel price and wage increases. And so the Fed uh, has made a small down payment in correcting the problem, but, but uh, the job is not done. <laughs> So, Lacey, what actions could and should the Fed be doing to reduce that liquidity? Well, it's best not to speculate on what could have been, but clearly uh, the Fed likes to say they're data dependent. Well, what does data dependent mean? Well, data dependent means that if the inflation rate moves above their target, the Fed responds. But the Fed waited long, more than a year. Right, we heard transitory and repeatedly. Half. Yeah, and, and so they, they weren't data dependent. Um, and, and so what, what has happened is they have greatly reduced their credibility. Uh, they said they would not be a spender of last resort, that they would operate strictly within the confines of the Federal Reserve Act, but they, they were. And uh, the consequences are now being felt. You. You simply, you simply cannot have uh, a dramatic increase in money relative to the supply of goods. And at the same time, the supply of goods is being reduced by the pandemic and the Ukrainian war and other factors. And, and so um, the Federal Reserve um, didn't maintain strategic focus. And we have 180 million families that have been hurt worse than in any other time in 42 years, which is a significant statement because the average age of our country is only 38. So more than half of our people do not know what has hit them. They create a bubble in housing. Uh, the bubble in housing uh, forced a lot of the, the newer uh, household formations to go into apartments and rental units. That's driven up the price of rent. Uh, there's a whole process now has to be unwound and it can't be unwound overnight, unfortunately. So isn't that an area though, where interest rates or fed fund rates would have an impact, a significant impact because this week for the first time, uh, in, 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 uh, let me, let me find it. I have it written down, but interest well, mortgage trade. rates for I mortgage rates it. above 6% since, uh, first time since 08. Right, That's so correct. that has to have an effect, right? Yeah, it is, it is having an effect. Um, the problem is that housing is a very small sector of the economy. And remember, there's a linkage here. You drive up the home sales, then you drive up the prices, the price of homes go up and then people shift into rent. Sure. Well, rent's a very big component of the cost of living. And, and so the home prices are now starting to come down, but you still priced out many, many people that might have bought and they're going into rental units, which is uh, forcing up the inflation. In other words, uh, the Fed is turned around and, and bit its tail. Uh, in other words, it's encountering the problems that it created. And uh, these, 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 these things take time. So if you were, if you were counseling the Fed today, what would you say with regard to reducing liquidity? I mean, they've talked about, and I, I interviewed Louis Gobb a few weeks ago, and we talked about quantitative tightening and the need for quantitative tightening for the Fed to reduce their balance sheet in a meaningful way. And Louis agreed that that was necessary, but he also agreed that it would have pretty significant impact on the economy, but he wasn't too worried about it because he said it hasn't really happened yet. Is it going to happen? Should it happen? Well, uh, keep in mind that monetary policy is a leading indicator of economic activity. A GDP um, is a coincident indicator. Uh, the inflation rate is a lagging indicator. Labor markets are a lagging indicator. Mm -hmm. um, just to give you an idea, um, the index of leading economic indicators peaked in February. It's been declining steadily since then. Uh, however, the LEI uh, peaks um, 10 or 11 months before the start of a recession. It doesn't, the monetary policy doesn't work overnight. Um, sure. The housing sector is a leading indicator of economic activity. It's, it's started to roll over. Um, one of the other aspects is that normally when, when monetary policy is tightening, 
the Fed uh, hits two of the big ticket sectors pretty simultaneously, automotive and housing. But automotive is depressed <laughs> to very low levels for other reasons. There was, there's a huge shortage of, uh, right. of product that has existed for a couple of years. Right. And, and so the automobile sector, although depressed, is not going lower. In, in other words, the, the, the only sector that of the domestic sectors that they're able to work on uh, is, is housing. And um, take another leading economic indicator, which is the spread between the two-year treasury and the 10-year. Um, right now, it's inverted about 40 basis points, which is, uh, with the exception of one little episode prior uh, to the 2000 recession, would be the steepest inversion since 1990. But if you look at the inversion of the yield curve from its first inversion to the start of the recession, we're talking about um, another 10 to 11 months. Well, the first inversion was in the Ju June to July period, which would then by the yield curve standard, the recession would occur in the second quarter of next year. Uh, so uh, looking at today's indicators and saying that the economy has not blossomed into a recession immediately is really a pointless commentary. Uh, by the way, um, I think we are seeing signs that um, the non-automotive um, big ticket consumer purchases are, are showing a marked deceleration in growth. It's still positive, but there is a marked deceleration. So um, the Fed is reducing liquidity, the short rates have come up, the yield curve is inverting, uh, and the process is working in the traditional cyclical uh, pattern. And I I'm afraid that the risk, the very significant risk, is that there, there will be a hard landing, not a soft landing, in spite of the fact that the economy has stayed relatively resilient so far. Lacey, is, is there any kind of silver lining to this in terms of higher interest rates because there's an entire generation out there that has never known what it's like to deposit money in a bank and earn interest. They've never seen it, it's never happened. I've tried to explain the difference between a checking account and a savings account to my kids and their, their takeaway was, okay, basically one you can write checks with and one you can't, that's the only difference. Mm -hmm. so, so, so we have the savings crisis in the US where approximately half of Americans can't handle uh, an unexpected $500 expense, where we've, uh, it's been estimated uh, by Boston College back in 2019 that we have a $7 trillion plus deficit for retirement savings. What, what, if we get past the recession, if the baseline interest rate is higher and we go back to having an incentive for savers, is it ultimately a good thing for the economy? Well, that effect is present, but, the, but there, are other, there are a lot of moving parts. And one of the moving parts is that um, the, we have 118 million uh, full-time hourly and salaried workers. And in the last 12 months, um, their real wages and salaries have dropped about 4%. We have 72 million retired people, 60 million um, that are in very marginal shape. We know from historical circumstances that retirees always suffer more in inflations than working folks. So you, you have 180 million people that have been severely damaged. Now, um, and so far uh, this year, uh, there has been a very, dramatic decline in the household saving rate. It's dropped down to about 5%. The historic average is nine. We're currently at five. Uh, where the saving rate is back where it was uh, in the great financial crisis in 2008. Now, what has happened? Well, uh, households were forced to hit the credit cards in order to pay for rising food, fuel, rent, and other basic necessities. And for the time being, 
the, the, the main impact on, on household saving is this deterioration in the standard of living. And, and so your effect would work in the way, uh, but, but not, not very quickly, not very quickly at all. Changing directions a little bit here, Lacey, you know, the, the, the global macro picture right now is, is so complex and it feels very fragile. How much do you, do you believe that uh, the Fed should take into account the, the needs or the impact of its actions on other countries? How much coordination is there or should there be even with the ECB, which has a, a very difficult situation on its hands with peripheral countries, with the Russia-Ukraine conflict heading into winter and, and a sort of a borderline energy crisis. There's a lot going on. Does that factor into the, the, the Fed's decision-making process? I think the Fed's greatest obligation is to our modest and moderate income households who've been absolutely devastated by the inflation rate. If there are things that can be done at the margin to aid the international economy, then okay. But we can simply not leave uh, these huge numbers of households in the condition that they are. They're literally flapping in the wind. And um, uh, the, the global situation, the Europe appears to be in recession, um, Recession is not a term that's very applicable to China because of the way in which they measure it. But it's going to, it's very clear. They've already acknowledged they won't hit their growth target. I don't know a time when they haven't, uh, when they've ever acknowledged in advance that they wouldn't hit the growth target. Um, in fact, the issue among the private forecasters is the degree to which they're going to miss the private target. They're very highly over leveraged. Uh, Europe is very highly over leveraged. Uh, their fundamentals were very weak before the Ukrainian invasion. Japan, a basket case. Um, the, the economic situation is so much worse overseas and in the United States that um, the dollar is um, basically more or less in terms of the Fed's broad measure at an all time high from the low point 10 years ago to where it is today, we're up about 45%. When the dollar goes up, a lot of goods are priced in dollars, food, fuel, a whole host of other things. And um, the, the, the net result is that um, their modest and moderate income households are, are suffer even more than ours. Um, and, and uh, also uh, the, a lot of the debt around the world, especially in the emerging markets, but even in, in um, China and, and Europe are denominated in dollars. Uh, Short-term interest rates are rising around the world. So uh, heavily indebted with interest rates going up, the cost of, of, of debt is increasing and um, this, this makes it for a very, very difficult situation. But, but the Federal Reserve, in my opinion, should always be to, to protect as many of our people as is necessary or as possible. It's a tough time to be a bond investor right now, Lacey. What do you say as could, a bond could, investor? Make one other point. Could I sure, make please, one? please. If the Federal Reserve had um, dealt with the inflation quickly and not let it triple, go to triple its target, they wouldn't have these problems. And that, that's one of the, that was one of the reasons for the so-called dual mandate. Because remember the unemployment rate was low, it was never a problem. Right. And um, they, ignored, they, they ignored what was happening to inflation and then it created this devastating impact for many. So. The, the, the failure of the Federal Reserve to uh, adhere to the mandate has created these problems, which are not only our problems, but the problems for the rest of the world. And, and so um, the Federal Reserve's culpability here cannot be ignored. It's front and center. 
And, and that's one of the reasons why they have to try to get this right. And, and because of the lags that are involved here, the risk of assault landing, in my opinion, are very, very low. So would you argue that, um, that a recession has to happen in order to get inflation under control? You can never make a statement like that, but it, it, it is the most likely case. We're gonna to have to see some, we're gonna to have to see significant reductions further in liquidity. What we've seen so far has not changed the fundamental picture going from, uh, from pre-pandemic levels to today. And as we get a further monetary constriction, um, demand will weaken further. Eventually the labor markets will weaken. They haven't weakened materially yet, not to any significant degree. Uh, but some of the leading indicators of the labor market are deteriorating. Uh, for example, the, the, the work week for production workers in the manufacturing sector, which is a great leading indicator. It's deteriorating, it's dropping, it's basically at an eight or nine year low, even though manufacturing firms are still adding workers, which means that they're adding workers because they, they they went through a period in which there was such a shortage of labor. So they're essentially hoarding labor. They don't want to give the workers up, but they're cutting the work week. They don't have things for them to do. Um, one of the uh, seven key determinants of a recession uh, is the uh, industrial output. And it, it's clearly flattened. Last month it was down a little bit. Um, and uh, in an environment in which you're adding employees and cutting the work week, it, it causes a severe decline in, in productivity, which cuts into corporate profits. And, and so even though the manufacturing sector has not seen a cut in the workforce, the firms that are in that sector in these circumstances are, are experiencing a decline in profitability that can only go on for, for a limited period of time. And so um, looking at the economy today and saying, because it's resilient today, doesn't mean that it couldn't change rather quickly. And I, I suspect as we go into the uh, latter part of the fourth quarter or the early part of next year, the con conditions will be materially weaker than they are today. So again, what, what would you say to, or what do you say to bond investors today, being a bond investor yourself? I think that bond investors um, should, should feel reasonably comfortable uh, that we are in the vicinity of the peak in long-term yields. It may be a little bit ahead of us. It may be a little bit behind us. I don't know. Uh, I think that it is it, the, the long end of the bond market is making a statement right now because the short end is rising because the Fed's going to tighten. Uh, there are further expectations of increases. Uh, bond investors are well, very well aware of that, uh, but the long bond yields are holding relatively steady. That's why uh, this yield curve is becoming more inverted mm -hmm. with the short further above. And uh, that's, that's a process that uh, is pointing to, first of all, it's gonna hurt the profitability of the financial intermediaries, which will reinforce the reduction in liquidity, and it will uh, also aid other efforts underway to reduce the inflation rate. So the, the long-term bond investors see that, and, and they're taking that into consideration. And even with that information, the bond yield is holding. It has been for, for you know, six or eight weeks. I see. Um... An interview with you never goes the direction that I anticipate, and and that's why I love speaking with you. Uh, it's 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 like taking a master course in half an hour. Uh, I will give you the last you word. <laughs> is is there anything, any other points that you would like our audience to to take away today? Well, I I think that um, I think that. The Federal Reserve Act of 1913 and its various modifications were very sound. 
And there were two key concepts that were in this act. And one was that the Fed should act as lender of last resort, not spender of last resort. And, and secondly, the Fed should be independent of fiscal policy. And when we, when we veered away from that, as we did in the early 70s and again in 2021, um, the result turned out to be quite disastrous. Not immediately. Initially, it was a success, but, but it became quite, quite a troubling situation. And so I, I think the Federal Reserve is, is well advised to, to do what it was constitutionally asked to do and not extend beyond that limit. I can only hope that those who are in a position of influence are watching. I have no influence on the process. <laughs> so I'm surprised you asked me and I um, offer that explanation with very little hope that it will be achieved. Understood. <laughs> Lacey Hunt, thank you so much for your time. It's always, My always a great pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much, Ed. Pleasure to answer your questions. They're the best. Viewers, we'll have a link to the Hoisington website where you can access Dr. Lacey Hunt's quarterly letters. These are must-reads for every investor. If you enjoyed this interview, please take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you'd like to receive a transcript of all of the interviews that we do each week, we'll also have a link where you can subscribe to our weekly global macro update emailer. My name is Ed D'Agostino from Malden Economics. Thanks for watching.